Hello, welcome to QUT News. Hello. And first tonight, Ipswich City Council is to be sacked over allegations of corruption against some members. The mayor has stepped aside and the Queensland government will appoint an administrator. The announcement comes just hours after Mayor Andrew Antonelli was charged with fraud by Queensland's Crime and Corruption Commission. The charges are the latest development in a widening corruption scandal. Premier Anastasia Palaget says the people of Ipswich have lost confidence in their elected leaders. Enough is enough. This will stop. I am stopping it. The people of Ipswich deserve better. Twelve people from Ipswich City Council, including two mayors and two CEOs, face a total of 66 charges. The government believes the situation in Ipswich is of grave concern. The people of Ipswich are shocked by what has happened. Some are angry, many are outraged. The government had been under increasing pressure to act. It's been slammed by the opposition for not acting oh, no, earlier sorry, is... and by one of its own members. ALP member for Bundamba, Joanne Miller, has long raised concerns about systematic corruption within the Ipswich City Council. I have been making complaints about the Ipswich City Council, both in the parliament, in the um, government, and um, in the Triple C for over 14 years now. Ipswich City Council will now be asked to show cause as to why it should not be sacked. Hinchcliffe is asking Parliament for stronger powers to dismiss non performing or fraudulent councils. Anna Ayres, QUT News. The Commonwealth Bank is under fire for apparently losing two tapes containing details of millions of accounts. However, it's confident that passwords and PIN numbers are safe. It's been a trying few weeks for Australia's banks at the Royal Commission. Now, for the Commonwealth Bank, it's gone from bad to worse. They have lost track of two data tapes which hold names, addresses and transaction details of 20 million customers and those customers were never notified. We consulted with the Privacy Commissioner at the time and a decision was made not to alert customers given the outcome of our investigation which found the tapes were most likely disposed of. The incident happened two years ago. The revelations of the blunder follow scathing criticism of the bank's board earlier this week at the Royal Commission. It found there was a complacent culture, dismissive of regulators, an ineffective board that lacked zeal and failed to provide oversight. Among other things, the bank has been accused of knowingly charging deceased customers for account fees. CBA has now emailed customers saying there is no official evidence that the tapes in the latest crisis have actually been misplaced. The bank has urged all customers not to be concerned and continue to use their accounts as normal. Anna McGraw, QUT News. And in another banking story today, the National Australia Bank is to divest itself of its wealth management arm, the MLC. It claims the sale is not related to the Royal Commission and revelations about financial advisory groups. NAB says it wants to concentrate on its core banking business instead. The decision was announced as NAB declared a half yearly net profit of nearly $2.6 million. Sydney Hospitality Juggernaut Rockpool Dining Group is ramping up in Queensland. It's opening three new restaurants and employing 200 people. This is Brisbane's Munich Brow House. There's lederhosen, schnitzels and free-flowing beer. And the acting mayor tapping the first keg. Huge venue, it's about a thousand seats, okay. Um, it's got a great beer garden attached to it. Uh, 17 beers on tap. The company already runs popular Bavarian beer cafe in the city, but its unique style of food and drink is about to become a whole lot more accessible. The Rockpool Group says it's on track to open three restaurants in coming months. Rockpool's investment of $8.5 million will create 200 jobs. It'll be a much needed boost for the Brisbane hospitality industry, who suffered after the closure of Damien Griffith's Donut Time Empire. Brisbane is a competitive market, but Council says there's room for new experiences. We have this uh, multicultural community here and all types of different food offerings. You can get all types of cuisine here in Brisbane. There's more and more on offer every week that goes by. The company believes Queensland's affinity with German culture has paved the way for their new restaurant. 
Queenslanders really love German fare, really love a good beer. Yeah. Ein, zwei, drei, zwei. Bridget Vanderwolf, QUT News. The tormented lives of thousands of domestic violence victims have been remembered in Brisbane. The candlelight vigil begins a month of focus on the issue. More than 100 people lit candles and remembered those who have suffered at the hands of their partners or family. It was a solemn acknowledgement of the need for better prevention and tougher laws. So the community events is great to get people thinking in a sense of community, thinking that, that they're part of uh, belonging to something like that so that they may want to help out their friend or their neighbour once they feel that they have that sense of belonging. Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk spoke at the event, which was organised at the start of Domestic and Family Violence Prevention Month. So last night I gathered with hundreds of Queenslanders at a candlelight vigil on the cliffs of Kangaroo Point to remember dear friends, colleagues and family members who are no longer with us because of domestic and family violence. The government launched the Do Something campaign this week with advertising online, on television and in cinemas. It hopes the campaign will encourage people to speak up about domestic violence and report offences. It is time for us to take a stand as a community and commit to do something. Doing something saves lives and doing this together changes society. The vigil was one of over 20 violence prevention events planned during May. Max Eagles, QT News. New Farm Park and Dutton Park are set to become river hotspots. New council developments will include docks for recreational and tourism boats, kayaks and water taxis. New Farm and Dutton Park are already popular in the River City. Now, the City Council has received the green light to transform them into lifestyle and transport hotspots. In particular, this is something as a river city that we think is a huge improvement, a huge step forward for tourism and for residents to be able to connect with the parks, with the playgrounds of Brisbane. She says the hubs will give Brisbane enhanced access to its iconic river and further opportunities to see the city from a different perspective. It's hoped increased transport options will encourage visitors to the New Farm region. Particularly Powerhouse, we've got a lot of activities here uh, that people will not only be able to drive to or catch a bus to, but they'll now be able to use whether it is a stand-up paddleboard, uh, a water taxi, all sorts of options to get them to the facility. Council says the developments will serve as a catalyst for further opportunities along the river, including further hubs connecting West End and the Botanic Gardens. The development promises to unlock tremendous recreational and tourism opportunities for Brisbane. If all goes to plan, visitors and residents will be able to enjoy access to Brisbane's greatest natural asset like never before. Alice Sinclair, QUT News. Two children had narrow escapes when a runaway garbage truck careered into their house in Sydney. The truck was parked and rolled downhill while the driver was out collecting bins. Police are still trying to determine if it was driver error or a mechanical fault that sent the truck into the Lilyfield home. The impact badly damaged the building, but before it got that far, the garbage truck had wrecked other prized possessions. Camper van, boat and car have all been taken out by this 12-tonne garbage truck and it's lost control and driven in the lounge room. A 10-year-old boy and 15-year-old girl were in the house at the time. They were trapped briefly in the lounge room but weren't hurt. Nevertheless, it was a terrifying experience and a very near miss. Kid in the lounge room is OK, which is great, but very, very shaken, as you would be if a 12-ton truck drives through your lounge room. The driver was emptying bins outside when the garbage truck rolled away. He was able to get back in, but couldn't stop the vehicle in time. Council engineers and police experts will examine the mechanics of the truck when it's finally pulled from the house. Gemma Niwa, QUT News. Looking again at our main story, the Mayor of Ipswich stands down over fraud charges. And still to come, wild celebrations in Italy as an iconic Vespa scooter turns 50. Suicide bombers have killed at least 12 people in an attack on Libya's Electoral Commission. Authorities have called it an attack on democracy. In a devastating attack, suicide bombers stormed the High National Election Commission, killing at least 12 people. They opened fire on employees before setting fire to the building. 
This witness, an employee, says men and women were murdered in cold blood. The commission says security forces tried to regain control in a gun battle and that there were at least two suicide bombers involved. Three employees and four security officers are among the dead. The head of the commission says it was an attack on democracy and the future of the Libyan people. Libya has been trying to organize elections in a UN-led attempt to stabilize the country after years of conflict and political division. It's believed the suicide bombing was aimed at derailing this. The Islamic State militant group has claimed responsibility for the attack. Jamaniwa, QUT News. Basque separatist group ETA has dismantled all its structures, ending a 50-year guerrilla campaign. While many people are relieved, others feel ETA deserved further punishment. ETA is responsible for around 850 deaths in the pursuit of an independent state in northern Spain and southern France. Violence peaked in 1980. During its bloodiest year, ETA was responsible for 100 deaths. It was 33 years ago when police chief Carlos Arcocha was killed by a car bomb set by the group. His daughter believes all the pain and suffering has been in vain. She says the terrorists have not achieved anything, so all they did was pointless. Madrid residents have mixed feelings. This woman says, on one hand it's good, but on the other they deserve further punishment for the pain they've caused. This man says it's good as long as they cooperate in the more than 300 unresolved cases. The end of ETA's political initiative has added pressure on the government to return jailed political protesters to Basque country. The city of Bilbao continues to march every Friday, demanding that ETA prisoners serve their sentences closer to home. ETA declared a ceasefire in 2011 and handed over weapons in April 2017. The end of the campaign was announced in a letter with details of its final dissolution expected later this week. Madeleine Escobar, QUT News. Cambridge Analytica, the firm embroiled in controversy over its use of Facebook data, is shutting down immediately. It faced mounting legal fees and lost clients. Parent company SCL Elections, which was founded over 25 years ago, has officially shut its doors telling employees to turn in their computers. The controversy started in 2014 after its alleged Cambridge Analytica harvested the personal data of 87 million Facebook users, in turn hurting the shares of the world's biggest social networking site and prompting multiple official investigations. The company, which was hired by President Donald Trump's 2016 election campaign, sought information from Facebook to form psychological profiles on a large portion of the US electric. Cambridge Analytica blames the media for driving away virtually all of its customers and suppliers. It said it was committed to helping the UK investigation about how Facebook used the data, but failed to meet the deadline to produce the requested information. The company says it will meet all obligations relating to all employees ensuring they receive their redundancy payments. Liam McGillivray, QUT News. A Chinese firm has broken the world record for having the most drones in flight at the one time. The drone manufacturer put on a spectacular show, lighting up the sky over part of central China. It sent up 1,374 drones, beating the previous record by 156. During the performance, the formation spelled out a popular slogan and paid tribute to China's economic initiatives. The company has plans for a drone to transport people at speeds of 130 kilometres an hour. The world's second largest meat processor is investing in technology to produce meat without slaughtering animals. Tyson Foods is backing an Israeli startup company to grow meat in a lab. The world's demand for meat is expected to double in the next 30 years. We don't have enough water resources, we don't have enough land resources to grow the meat demands for the uh, uh, rapidly developing Chinese and Indian economies. Future meat technology focuses on producing fat and muscle cells, the core building blocks of meat. While lab-grown meat isn't a recent concept, the primary hindrance to its success has always been the cost of its production. That's when the Israeli startup entered the market, developing a more cost-effective way to meet the demand. 
In 2013, it cost $3 million per kilogram of meat. Just five years later, that was $20,000 per kilogram. We can now produce for about $100 per kilogram product and drop it all the way down to $5 per kilogram by 2019. A study by Oxford University and the University of Amsterdam estimates cultured meat produces 96% less greenhouse gases than their living and breathing counterparts. Future Meat Technologies' final product has already been taste tested in a Jerusalem restaurant. Toby Rowan, QUT News. Thousands of Italians have been celebrating the 50th anniversary of a famous Vespa scooter. It's so popular they've opened a museum in its honour. Possibly one of the coolest inventions of all time, the Vespa has tens of thousands of fans celebrating its golden jubilee. The Vespa means wasp due to the sound its engine makes. The Vespa per, uh, per Italia è stile italiano. The Vespa Club chairman says, for Italy, it represents Italian style. For Pontedera, it means prosperity. The Tuscan town has been at the heart of the celebrations. This fan says, the Vespa really means to be free and to share the joy with everyone. The first Vespas were manufactured in 1946, after the Second World War, when Italian air traffic was severely restricted. The Primavera model, the most iconic design, was produced in 1968, making it a light but nippy machine at a price which most people could afford. La Vespa cos'è per me? È un stato un mezzo un mezzo di This man says we have been able to move freely with a vehicle that's born in our time. To mark the anniversary, Piaggio, the scooter's manufacturer, has opened a Vespa museum in Pontedera with 250 exhibits dating back to 1909. It's expected thousands of diehard fans will come to the exhibit for a glimpse of that good old Italian style. Liam McGillivray, QUT News. The legacy of one of Australia's greatest F1 drivers will live on in the form of an Australian supercar. Sir Jack Brabham has been honoured with a sleek new vehicle worth nearly $2 million. A very special tribute. 50 years on, Brabham's son David will oversee the Adelaide-based project. There'll be 70 new Brabham BT62 vehicles with a hefty $1.8 million price tag. We've got the, the, the Brabham V8 engine in the back as well, with, um, well, in Australian terms, 700 horsepower. Brabham was the first and only person to win the world championship with a self-built car. The supercar was launched in London, and is lightweight carbon fibre, weighing in at just 970 kilograms. They will all be racetrack vehicles with no plans yet for a road legal version. This is a flagship project. I think there'll be all sorts of spin-off into other areas. If you want one, it does come in right-hand drive. Toby Rowan, QUT News. Former test opener Justin Langer has been appointed head coach of the Australian cricket team. He takes over from Darren Lehman, who resigned after the ball tampering scandal. Langer has been coach of the West Australian team for six years. He says he's now pleased to be giving back to the country that launched his career. In rugby league, Manly's horror season could be about to get a whole lot worse. Coach Trent Barrett may leave. He's met with his legal team and discussed possible breaches of contract. While in the AFL, St Kilda star Dylan Robertson has been advised by doctors to sit out the rest of the season. He's undergone heart tests after collapsing in the Saints game against Geelong. Kate McCormack has all the weather details next. And an Aussie to play a role in Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's wedding. Hello, it's been another lovely autumn day here in Brisbane with a bit of cloud cover clearing overnight. In fact, there have been pleasant conditions all around the southeast today and similar maximums. If you're heading interstate tomorrow, pack your brolly with wet and windy conditions forecast down south. Rain for Canberra, Hobart and Adelaide and a thunderstorm in Melbourne, Perth and Darwin will be fine. Around Queensland now and many of the coastal centres will be cloudy with some showers. A top of 30 in Townsville, 28 in Bundaberg and 32 at Longreach. If you're out on the bay in the morning, sunrise will be at 14 minutes past 6 
Keep an eye out for those 10 to 15 knot winds swinging northeast later in the day with calm seas below half a metre. It should be mostly sunny on the Gold and Sunshine coasts tomorrow with tops in the high 20s. Finally, the three day outlook for Brisbane, mostly sunny and 28 on Friday and much the same over the weekend. That's the weather for now. I hope you enjoy your Friday. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have now chosen their horse-drawn wedding carriage and Australian Philip Barnard Brown will be the head coachman on this special day. The happy couple have chosen an open-top Ascot Landau carriage for their procession from St George's Chapel through Windsor. Melbourne-born Philip Barnard Brown will be riding the lead homebred horse, Milford Haven, to tow the royals along their route. He will be the lead postillion on the left-hand side, so I'll be riding him for, for the carriage on the day. Mr Barnard Brown has worked for Her Majesty for more than 15 years and is now the senior coach to the Queen. I was lucky enough to be here in 2001, sorry 2002, for the Golden Jubilee uh, and when the Gold State Coach went out and that was a very special moment. I think this um, is one of those moments for me, yeah. Prince Harry travelled in the same carriage to the wedding of his elder brother William and Kate Middleton in 2011 when he acted as best man. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle will be married on Saturday the 19th of May. Anna McGraw, QUT News. That brings you up to date with QUT News. Goodbye for now. Goodbye.